I interviewed Saul Dreyer. He was born in Poland and he went to three internment camps. And right now he's 89. And he started a band about Holocaust survivors. So it's him and Holocaust survivors. And they go around the country and sing Jewish songs. And he gave me a pin. It says Holocaust Survivor Band, Never Again. And then his serial number, which is 86450. And, well, I really enjoyed doing stuff with him, talking to him. I learned a lot, and it was a lot of fun just to learn about the experience that he had. And I'm glad he could share that with me. How old were you when the, when the war started? I was 13, 14 years old. Okay. And, and what did like? What did you do on like a daily basis before? Daily basis before what? Before the war started, and you were um, sent to camps. If I went to camps, I was normal like you. I was going to school. Did you uh, as a matter of fact, I tell you something. Uh, when I when the war started, I was in the seventh grade or six. I don't remember. I was in the I mean sorry. I was in the in lower grade. In the higher grade, it was a student who was you who was a pope. You know the pope that passed away, the Polish pope. Yes. I went to same school with him. Oh, uh, John Paul. John, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. He he comes from my city. And we were together at the same school, except I was five, uh, five uh, years younger than him, so I was in a lower class. When he graduated, went to the monastery, I, I was first in the second, first or second or third grade. Okay. So I want you to be aware of it. Mm. Next. So, okay. like, where did you live? Would I live in the city is Krakow, Poland. It's uh, it's on the um, southwest of Poland, big city. Warsaw is the biggest one, and after Warsaw was Krakow. We had they, we had uh, half a million people living. Among half a million, we had eighty thousand Jews. Uh, and so, what would you do after school? Oh, at the school we had I, had I had many things. By us, we had a double school in the morning till. Two, three o'clock, two, three o'clock, went to, to public school like you. After public school, we went to a special school for, for Jews only. They called the Haida, you know, and you learn the, the Jewish, uh, the Torah and the, all the Jewish uh, uh, religious stuff. Over there, we did, we had a little recreation. Either we box a little bit in the classes or we play soccer. It was one among soccer players. And what was your, like, your lifestyle like? Like that? My lifestyle was a wonderful lifestyle. I had a sister, and a, and my mother, and my father. My father was a military man. He's a, he was a, a officer, so I saw him only once a week because he was, uh, you know, in his office. He was, he was uh, in our city. The, uh, the, uh, in the, he was, how we say it. He's in the recruiting uh, department, you understand? So he interviewed people who goes to the, to the army, who can be uh, released from the army, you know those things. Okay, and what, what camps did you go to? Oh, I went through like this. I went to the first, my first camp was uh, uh, Krakow Prashov. After this, after this, they shipped me to Schindler. You know, you heard about Schindler? Mm -hmm. uh, to, to Schindler factory, there were three factories there. It was Schindler factory, the factory I was, which they call it NKF. We were, we were repairing water and oil coolers for the jets, for the German jets. Or aeroplanes, I don't know at that time they had the jets. And also there was a Schindler factory, you know, you heard about it, it's very famous, you know. And also we had a factory, a mill, where they were cutting lumber and shipping to where I came from <coughs> to, build the, to build the barracks 
for the prisoners. And those, those three factories had one camp, and we watched by the, the, uh, the, the director of the camp was an assessment, a German, but the rest of them were Ukrainian. That they, you know, they, they, uh, they changed, uh, they became like, uh, you know, they, they play along with the Germans. And, and what, in this camp I was at least probably two years. From there I was shipped back to Pwashov, you know, and over there there were trains waiting for us and they put us all to a cattle cat, cattle trains. If you saw the picture, Schindler, you can see that, that they were pouring water and the, and the cattle trains were so hot we couldn't take it before the train left. And they load up, there must have been 100, uh, 100 uh, cars going to Auschwitz. And we came to Auschwitz. In this, in this 100 cars was the Schindler's List, people from the Schindler List, they were the last one. When we came to Auschwitz, and the, and the, and the train station there was so loaded with trains because at the same time the German was bringing the wounded from Russia, they were fighting in Russia, and somehow they, they, they uncoupled the train that took the people that were supposed to go to, to Schindler, left them there, they went to Auschwitz, and us, they sent to Austria, we were traveling a night in a day till we came to Mauthausen in Austria. This was my next camp. But when they unloaded us from Mauthausen from the heat, we were crammed by 100 people in, a, in one car. We had nine, in my wagon was alone, nine deaths. Nine dead people. Heart attack, you know, tramping, watching all the, no toilets, nothing. We were traveling, we were traveling day and night. But what happened? When we arrived to Austria, the train had to stop. They had to put in water in the, loco in, you know, in the locomotive. So over there, the German was nice enough. They let us out, and we were washed a little bit. You know, this there was there was uh, like uh, like a faucet, big faucet. They were pouring water, the, you know, so they can get the steam to move the train. And that's how we got to Mauthausen. Over there, they stripped us completely nude. Completely. We're left over with nothing. And uh, then, being in Mauthausen, I used to work carry stones from a, from a stone, uh, uh, how do you call it? Quarry? Quarry, right? On the top, you know, and on steps. Completely new, just in the pajamas. And uh, no food, no nothing. Finally, they started to separate us. And they sent me to a city by the name Linz in Austria, another camp. But this camp is already mixed. We were the first Jewish people to come to the camp. They had gypsies, they had Italian, they had German, they had Polish people, they had Belgian, they had people from all over the, the Russian, from all over the Europe in this camp. And they brought us in and we got into this, the, the last two barracks that they kept for us probably. And I went in an assignment. I, met, I told them I was a welder because I was a welder when I was working at the, uh, preparing the uh, uh, radiators and they sent me to a factory when I was welding uh, 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 components for anti-craft uh, artillery, anti-airplane uh, uh, artillery. And over there I was liberated in 1945. Okay. And so the houses that they crammed all the Jews in, you built those? Uh, yeah, yeah it, uh, some of them I built, but not in, uh, in Pwashov. I built the, the barracks, they called it. We were living three on top each other. Bottom, middle, and top. Everything from wood. No, no mattresses, no beds, no nothing. Straw. We were laying, living on straw. And then they had the, the commandant of this camp was very rough man to kill people there every day. So one day, they, they went and they cleaned up a, a uh, hospital. The people were sick in the hospital in the camp. And they dug a, a grave, a, a, a massive grave for many, many people. And they selected people and uh, we used to carry. I carry two people. One, and they sent me one small, only two. That alive, we throw them in and we used to shoot them and bury them in this camp where I was. 
And I was one that was carrying, carrying the, the people from the hospital and the, to be killed in a, in a massive, massive grave. You know how to say that, massive grave. Anything else? Um, let's see. Um, how were you liberated? I was li very interesting. This is a long story. I don't think we'd be able to even do it. It happened, we had a camp director, we were in the camp, all mixed, all mixed in. And all of a sudden, three prisoners escaped from this camp. What nationality they were, I don't know till now. And they escaped. Because the prisoners escaped, the German officer, who was the camp director, got very upset. And he took us all out and brought us over every morning. And the, and the place they were counting us, without food, without nothing. And one morning they smelled that they knew already that, that, the, that, the, that the American are coming. So they took us and marched and walked us out, out of the camp into a cave. And in this cave they had dynamite. And this is a whole story I say because of the, but I, it's not for now. And this, uh, and we, those three guys that escaped came with guns and started to shoot, and we had a whole commotion there. And nobody walked into the cave. But this time the German, the American pulled in, you understand, so all the Germans ran out away, and we started to disperse, and the, and the cave blew up, blew up. So if we would be in the camp, we were 1,500 people, we would be dead. And then I met a, I met a, a saw a jeep. I was walking back to the camp, I know where to go. I said, Nahed Gangreen, you see, I was, uh, I was wounded. See, Nahed Gangreen had this finger in my hand, he held the, the, the shrapnels from the bomb. And I walked in and I see a jeep pulls in with a guy in a helmet, he had a red cross. So I stopped him and he saw me in the, in the you know, in the uh, prisoner's uh, uniform. And he asked, I asked him, do you speak Jewish? He says, no, I speak German. So I said, speak a little bit. He asked me, who are you? So I said, I'm a Jew. So he showed his that he's too. And what happened, this guy, I showed him, he took me into a house, and not only me, a few guys, and there was a, the German had, had uh, uh, meat, bread, butter, and they fed, he feed us. He made them that they feed us. From there, he took me to the hospital. To be, he saw right away I'm wounded, so he took me to the hospital with his jeep, and he left me there to be operated. And he, he went to his uh, captain or the, uh, our officer high, and he told him the story. So the officers told him, you don't leave, stay here until this fellow come from the hospital. If you're gonna see he's all right, you're gonna join us. So he was waiting for me for three days. When he came back, I was on bandage and everything, and he, and he took pictures. And eventually, I got the pictures from him. I got one, make a big one. Whenever I go and speak, I show the picture. Wounded with the uniform right after the hospital. A funny thing happened. I remember his <coughs> name. I remember his name. And when I came to the United States, I came to the United States in 1949. At that time, I was single. So there was a Manhattan, there, there, there was a place that people used to go every Saturday and meet. It was a dancing place. And 72nd Street, I found, got the name, Rosalind. Rosalind is the name. And one day I go there, and people mingle a, a month, and the, the, the people are talking. I was in the army, I was here, I was there. And I talked to a guy, I said, do you know a guy but this is his name? He says, yes, he's standing right here, he lives in Manhattan, I met him there. The person who the, the person that, that took me to the hospital, the, the American GI that helped me to to recuperate from my wounds. Wow. Um, um, so. Uh, but now, after the war, after the war, I, I I was I was shipped to Italy. I was living in Italy for four years. I was in a displaced person camp. You know that the that the Jewish brigade. That, fight, that was fighting together with the English against the German, 
and about the young people. I was among the youngest people, you know, and they brought all the young people to Italy, you know, to a UNRWA camp. I don't know if you know what it is, but they, they, there was this uh, displacing camp, they called the DP camp. We're living single family, we were recuperated from uh, from the, you know, from the, from the war. We're all young people, and in this camp, my, uh, we had a camp director who was a, a Englishman, and one morning, uh, the truck pulled in and brought a, brought a piano and a set of drums. And uh, because we had nothing to do at night, the, the, the Italian had a hole, they gave us all the houses. The, the Jewish, uh, the Jewish uh, people from America were paying for the rent, for the food force, for everything. And nobody wanted to volunteer to play the drums. Nobody they wanted to dance, they wanted to enjoy yourself. And I had a guy who was also liberated he was from Yugoslavia, he survived with his wife, he played piano, and I volunteered to, uh, to play the drums. So I played the drums, that's why after I came to America, after 60 some years, I just started to play the drums. I never played in between. And so, what kind of food would you be served in the camp? Oh, just uh, water, water with potatoes. Black coffee in the morning, and I and I, the bread was cut in four quarters. Each man got a quart of bread, dry bread, not that's it. Would sit like every day. Every day. Is that all you got for one day? Yeah, we in the morning coffee with a piece of bread. During the day, nothing. In the evening, we used to come to carry big bottles with with uh, with uh, food, and whoever was lucky got a little potato or something. If you were lucky, you just got the top. It was disgusting. That's how we survive. But that's how we live, but we couldn't survive. A lot of people die <coughs> from everything. Okay. So, what kind of in the camps, so how many people were crammed in the, the houses or barracks? Well, in the barrack, maybe two, three hundred people in one, in one barrack, maybe more, I don't know. They were small? Well, they were big. They were, the, the barracks must have been as, five times as big as this. This house, and the one piece, and people three on top, and so we have a few hundred people living in one barrack. Mm -hmm. Two, three hundred. We had also, we had outside, we had to go to the bathroom. There was no bathrooms. There was a hole that we had to go. No, no shower, no, nothing. So you didn't shower for years? I did not for years, but we shower later. You know, had, let me put it this way we somehow get organized with the, the cajos, you know. How is that explained? We're self, we would want to be self-efficient, like the prisoner in a, in a, in a you know, the prisoners today in a, in a jail. That's self-efficient too. They cook themselves, you know. They, you know, they buy the cell. Not the same way we did it. Did we're you prisoners. Ever, um, did you ever try to escape, or no. when you knew no. try to escape? It's, it's out of the question. You couldn't? Because if you escape, now, for example, if you escape, the Poles would find you, they would right away squeal at you. Now, if you were, if you were in the German camp, like in Mauthausen, then we, had, we were caught here, you see, like this, so you, you had don't care on the side, but you had a stripe like this, here, so they know we're prisoners. And then we, we were in prisoners' pajamas, so how could you escape? You had nothing. No money, no pencil, no nothing, nothing, nothing. You were complete. Yeah, you had one a, a spoon in a in a in a, a, a utensil for the soup. That's it. That's we. That's what you were. You were all possession. In a shoe with the with the wooden soles. Shoes with wooden soles. When did you say you came to America? In 1949. And so. What made you decide to come to America? I don't remember made me decide. I was, I was working uh, uh, in Italy for the Jewish emigration for Israel, but I had an uncle in Brooklyn, and he found, he found me. I'm one sole survivor from the whole family. So this uncle in Brooklyn uh, uh, sent papers, but I didn't need the papers because at that time they, call, they called it a Truman doc Doctrine. Truman the, uh, they, they made a law to let in all the Holocaust survivors to the United States, so that's how I came. I came an American 
navy ship by the marina jumper from Italy, from Naples. What made you decide to come to Florida? Oh, that's another story. I was very, I was living in New York, in Brooklyn. Then I moved to New Jersey, we opened a business, and I met my wife. We got married. And later on, my wife hated the cold weather. And we decided, I had a friend here who was, was very successful here in Florida, and he brought me over. And I was working for him, Poison, and then became a partner right in Miami. And I was living in, I was building houses in Cold Springs. And then I opened another business in, in, uh, in Cold Spring. I built my house in Cold Spring. But you have to understand, I tell you what happened. I was building a house for a fellow, an Italian fellow, Tony Finelli, who sold his house. His wife had a mask, asthma. And he moved with his wife and three children to Florida. And he bought a house by me. And when I finished his house, he moved in. He came to me. He says, Mr. Dreyer, what am I going to do now? I got three children, I have to make a living. His father passed away, they had a gasoline station in the Bronx. And I told him, Tony, what do you know what to do? He says, I know how to cut a little glass. At that time I was building with college properties, with West Westinghouse was selling the land in Cold Springs. I told him, Tony, you go buy a truck, and I'm going to give you all the customers, we're going to be 50-50. He hired a guy in my garage as I was building the houses. He was coding mirrors and everything. And we were installing for the builders in the bathrooms all over. This was my second business. Okay. And he's still in the business. I sold him for a dollar. When I, but you have to understand, when, when I was building that thing, 23 years ago, I had cancer in my stomach. And I, had, I was operated. I lost three quarters of my stomach. I had a very small stomach. I had chemotherapy. And I, I survived. I am in remission. So I've been in remission already 23 years. So that's that, that's why I stopped after I got my cancer. I <coughs> two three, de three years later I called it quit and retired. Now last year I decided to. And somebody and there was a woman in in uh, London. She was a pro pronounced piano player. And I, I read an article on my computer some, some morning last year that she was 110 years old. She survived the, uh, the Holocaust because playing piano with her son, her, her husband perished with another daughter. And, and she passed away. And she also won the, uh, the, how you call it, the, from Sweden, how you call it, the award. No, I, Forget it. You know that they, that they give people once a year from Sweden, they get $200,000. I forgot how they call that. The uh, Nobel Prize. She won the Nobel Prize. And, and, and home, and I woke up my man and my wife in the morning. I said, You haven't seen the article. The arti all the articles talk about it. I woke my wife in the morning. I said uh, to my wife, Clara, I came with the idea. I said, and this lady, Anna, I told her the story, I would like to put together a, 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 a Holocaust survivor band, a, uh, band, a Holocaust survivor band. So my wife says, you're crazy. So, you know, I belong to a, to a how you call it, to a, a synagogue in Margate. It's, it's a reform synagogue, you know. We play music on a Saturday, and uh, it's very reformed. Even though I, I, was, uh, I was very religious before then, but it's not important. Uh, so I came to my rabbi and I tell Rabbi Henry, listen, listen to this, uh, I would like to put together, and I told the same story. So he told me also that I'm crazy. So I thought people told me crazy. I said, no, I'm going to do anything to put together the band. And that's how I put that together. And since last April or May, <coughs> we're playing together, we've got concerts, we're traveling and everything. Is there anything like that's like stood out to you during your time at the camps? That you'd like that stood out to you during the time at the camps you'd like to share? Who? Okay. Is there is there anything that you can think of from the camps that you'd like to oh, share? Oh, I don't want to think about it. 
but sometimes I do, because I tell you what happened. Me and my wife, we, my wife is a Holocaust survivor too. We were interviewed by, you know, the Shoah, Spielberg, you heard about Spielberg, he's the producer, you know, in New Hollywood, and, and they brought a camera to my house. I was interviewing my wife. At that time, I was talking a, lot, a little bit about the camps, about my living uh, during the war, before the war. But lately, during the whole time being in the United States, I never discussed this with the children. Once in a while with my wife, she told her whole story. I told her my story, but the major thing I didn't tell nobody, except what happened last year, my rabbi uh, was invited uh, to, a, to a book club, you know, book club in, the, in the Parkland. He says, come on, Sal, I'm gonna take you with me. I said, why are you taking me? Because they told me that a couple people there in the book club that they're Holocaust deniers. You know what a Holocaust denier is? You know? Mm -hmm. So when he told me this, I was very upset. I said, Rabbi, I'm going with you. And I went there. They had about 30 to 40 women. They were all professional, the husband. They had different, different religion, different colors, and also different professions. They were women, lawyers. They had husband, door judges. They had husband, dentists. You know, a mixed group in a private house, big house in Parkland. And one woman came to me and he says, Mr. Dreyer, I would want to ask you a question if you can tell me. I says, what? He says, you know, I would, I would ask you something. Could you tell me if you wrote it off there, if I forgot about it, what happened? You understand? But this one is a word here in English where she said it. If I can recall it, I'm going to tell you. You know, uh, I tell you the word, I'm going to express myself, maybe you're going to get the word. If there's a trial, you know, somebody kills another. So the, the, the victims want to forget about it. So they, they ask it the name, I forgot the name, you know, like you want to wipe it out. There's an American name, an English sure. name. Sweep it under the rug? Like, sweep it under the rug? Like no, 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 but the one word is it. Can, yeah, well, I can, well, I can. So I told them, so I told them one story. So they all started to cry. But I don't want to repeat it. Yes, you're too young for it. Okay? Well, I can't think of anything else. Anything else? Anything else you want to share? Big pardon? Anything else you, you do want to share? Well, uh, what I want to say, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 90. I'm going to be 90 years old in April. And I play the drums. And I join what I do. I, I came up from retirement, and I'm busy now. I don't make money, but I'm busy. Mm. When did you learn to speak English? I learned here, I went to school. When I came to the United States, I, I, was, I was working at night as a welder in Brooklyn, and they gave me the privilege, and I went to high school with children during the day. I slept uh, afternoon after the high school, and I went night to work. So that's how I look. Uh, and then during the time, I got, I got four children, six grandchildren. But this time I should be able to talk English. <laughs> I speak with an accent, but better than nothing. <coughs> I, speak, I speak four languages too. I speak Polish, German, English, and Italian. Did you pick those up at the camps? Or uh, no, or just you know? uh, living in Italy, I spoke Italian. Polish just had to speak because I was living in Poland, I went to school. And the uh, Jewish German is a uh, very common uh, language among Jews, so that's it. Okay. Well, thank that's you. it. It was a pleasure talking to you. Bye bye. <laughs>